my friends are sins. Okay, so that and recently I was fortunate enough to get to travel to San Francisco with work. Now, despite what you're seeing on the screen here, I didn't actually fly United Airlines, but I needed some juicy B-roll for my wonderful travel vlog. And so I basically just recorded any old plane that was in the airport, and I apologize deeply for that deception. I was really looking forward to exploring the city over the course of a few days, take some street photos, do some video and all that kind of thing, because I hadn't been here in about 10 years or so. Doors are closing. Please stand clear of the doors. Now, as you can probably tell from looking out the train window here, the weather wasn't particularly great. I was anticipating sunny Californian days, but instead I got kind of Glasgow-like cloudy skies. And that was a bit of a problem since I hadn't packed anything other than shorts, but you know, we made do in the end. Anyway, my big idea was that I wanted to try and shoot some video on this old Canon Digicam that I'd bought recently and tap into the zeitgeist of everyone that's talking about these handheld cameras. However, it wasn't long before something else caught my eye. We were wandering around through Chinatown and I found this wee camera shop which was absolutely stacked to the rafters with old digital cameras from the early 2000s. Now these have become all the rage recently because Gen Z YouTubers have rediscovered these old cameras and decided that they give your photographs and video the film look, quote unquote, which is absolute nonsense. However, I was interested in trying them out for myself. And in particular, I wanted to get one of the ones from the Canon SD range because they had an optical viewfinder, which is fairly unusual in cameras of this vintage. Now, in the end, I didn't get quite the camera that I wanted. I was looking for the SD1000 or something like that, but I found the SD780, which was actually a bit of a newer model, and it had the all important optical viewfinder. I think it's it's called the Exus 100 or something in the UK. Uh, I'm not entirely sure about the naming conventions, but anyway, I ended up paying probably more than I should have, but I got one and that's what you're watching me on now. Now my first impressions were that this thing is really, really tiny, as in totey, tiny, teeny wee camera. It's about the same size as a credit card, although obviously a wee bit thicker. And because of that alone, I actually really, really love it. This is one of the smallest cameras that I've ever shot with and it literally fits in my pocket to the extent where I find myself looking for it because I feel like it's not actually there. Now there's nothing particularly special about this camera other than the optical viewfinder or really any other digicam from the early 2000s, though people have got some kind of obsession at the moment with cameras that have got CCD sensors and for the purposes of this video I'm not going to go into that but it's not really all that important and that's not really why I got this thing. The truth is that I have never really liked shooting with old digital cameras. The earlier ones that came out were pretty terrible in terms of color reproduction and everything else. And the ones that came along later, like these, didn't really have any manual controls to allow you to capture the shots that you wanted. Now this camera is no exception. It has no manual controls really other than changing the ISO. And whilst I would have hated that years ago, now I've actually found it to be quite liberating. When I take pictures with this camera, instead of having to focus on whether or not I've got the right shutter speed and the right aperture so that everything is exposed correctly, instead all I have to worry about is looking for interesting things and I can pay more attention to the composition, which to be honest hasn't really been a massive priority for me otherwise. When it comes to that all important optical viewfinder, which I really wanted to have, eh, the truth is that I haven't really used it that much. You can turn off the back display like the Ricoh GR series, which is pretty cool because it means you can focus on the viewfinder a bit better. But because I've got glasses and the viewfinder is really tiny, it's not really that easy to see and I have to take off my glasses. So that's a bit of a shame, but it's not, you know, the be all and end all. Ultimately, I've enjoyed the process of taking pictures with this, finding snapshots out and about around me. It's kind of a different way of approaching photography, as it were. Unfortunately, San Francisco was much quieter than I had anticipated, and the streets were far less busy than I remember them being, which made it much harder to get the kind of photos that I wanted, you know, much harder than it would be in somewhere like New York or something like that, for example. However, when we made our way down to the pier or the harbour area or whatever it's called, there were far more people, and so I was able to spend a bit of time exploring what I could do with this. Now, whilst the quality of the pictures from the camera was nowhere near 
something like the Ricoh GR3 and that shouldn't be a surprise. It was really fun to shoot with and people barely gave it a second look when I was taking pictures. It is definitely not an ideal camera for street photography, so don't listen to anybody out there on YouTube that tells you it is. You know, oh, I can't believe I've discovered this perfect street photography camera from 2006. That is not the case. It is a crappy old digital camera and it simply doesn't have the manual controls or the speed that you need in order to take street photos, at least not in the way that I like to take them. However, I was able to get some shots that I thought were pretty cool and that have their own particular character. The images themselves are pretty contrasty, which I like, though the dynamic range is fairly limited, which again, shouldn't be a surprise. But this does mean that if you try and push the JPEGs too much in post-processing, they very quickly will start to look pretty weird, which is something I very distinctly remember from the early 2000s. There is some kind of hack that you can do with the firmware that apparently allows you to get raw files from them. But to be honest, I haven't really bothered because if I'm going to do that, I may as well just use something like the Ricoh anyway. One thing I did notice is that the camera has this tendency to overexpose, uh, reducing the shutter speed much more than it needs to be. And so you would often get these kind of blurry images, even in broad daylight. This isn't helped by the fact that auto ISO only goes up to ISO 400, but there are a few things you can do to get around that, such as increasing the ISO up to 800 or 1600 manually, or, and this has been the better option for me, dial down the exposure compensation by about two thirds of a stop. And that gives you perfectly exposed images and means that you don't drop your shutter speed too much. So if you've got one of these things, watch out for that. So are these cameras actually worth it? Well, it depends. If you're able to find one in a good condition for a relatively cheap price, and by that I mean up to about 50 pounds, then I say go for it. They are pretty terrible in low light situations. They don't really find focus and they generally look pretty crap. And obviously they're not gonna be any good in any situation where quality is important or if you need control over the individual elements of your exposure. However, they are fun to play around with. They are pretty great for outdoor snapshots, particularly on sunny days. And to be honest, they do give you a bit of a different perspective to taking pictures, which for some people is invaluable. Would I pay a few hundred quid for one of these? Well, probably not. I mean, I think I actually did, but I wouldn't recommend that anyone else do that. One of the big questions, of course, is why don't you just use your mobile phone for these kind of photos? Because everybody's got some kind of expensive device already in their pocket, which probably does a much better job than this ancient thing. And yes, if you've got an iPhone of any kind, really, then it will blow this out of the water in terms of quality and speed and everything else. However, I've got a really crap phone in my pocket. I don't spend that much money on them. And because of that, it's got a really crappy phone. And secondly, I, like I suspect many others, like to have separate dedicated hardware devices to do specific jobs. There's something really pleasing about having a wee camera as opposed to taking photos with your phone, even if it does mean it's less practical. It gives you a different way of looking at taking photos, which is actually really important when it comes to something that is a creative, expressive outlet. At the end of the day, if you're interested in taking pictures and video and you like to experiment with different formats and you can find one of these old things for an okay price, then go for it. But if you don't get one, then it doesn't really matter. You're not missing out on anything particularly interesting or secret or special or anything like that. It's just a cool thing to fuck about, eh? So for now, goodbye.